I'm Natalia Brizuela, and I'm a professor uh, at UC Berkeley. And with Leticia Sabsai, I'm the co-editor of the Critical South book series at Polity, where Pablo Jarsun's book, Doing Justice, has been recently published, and that is bringing us together today. This book series publishes the work of key scholars and intellectuals from the Global South, whose interventions complicate both the North-South divide and the established Euro-American canon of critical theory. This book series is one of the projects of the International Consortium for Critical Theory Programs, of which I am co-PI with Samira Esmir. The consortium is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. And we are infinitely grateful to both for their commitment and support of the consortium. I want to thank the members of the consortium team, as well as the members of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for all the work they've done to set up and run today's event. As most of us know at this point of our Zoom life, it takes a lot of um, human infrastructure uh, besides technical infrastructure to have these things happen. So in particular, I want to thank Brianna George, Tim Wyman McCarthy and Miranda Schoenberg. I'm going to introduce Jacques Lesra, who will be moderating today's event and today's conversation about uh, around Pablo's book. Um, and then give a couple kind of housekeeping informations around translation and the Q&A uh, format. Um, Jack will then introduce the rest of the panelists as well as Pablo Jarsun. So Jacques Lesra, who I am honored and thrilled to have with us today as moderator um, for this event for many reasons, but one of them also being the fact that he wrote the, the beautiful a prologue forward to uh, Pablo's book in English. All the books in the series have um, prologues uh, or forewords by scholars, usually uh, from the global north um, that help establish and at least kick off conversations. So. Uh, thank you, Jacques, for writing that prologue for the book, for being a supporter of the series, and for all the work that you do in general. Jacques Lesra is professor and chair of Hispanic Studies at UC Riverside. He's a scholar of comparative as well as Spanish language literature, and he focuses his research in the fields of philosophy, the literature and visual culture of Spain and Europe in the early modern period, Marx and Marxism, and the theory, philosophy, and practices of translation. He is the author of numerous books, and I am only going to name uh, his most recent, his three most recent books, which are República Salvaje de la Naturaleza de las Cosas from 2019, um, On the Nature of Marx's Things from 2018, and Untranslating Machines, a Genealogy for the Ends of Global Thought from 2017. In addition, Lesra has edited collections of essays um, on allegory and political representation with Tara Mendola, on the work of Althusser, Balivar, and Machery, and on Spanish Republicanism. He has published widely on Cervantes, Lopez, Shakespeare, contemporary and early modern translation theories and practices, Freud, Althusser, Wolf, animality studies, and numerous other topics. Lazar is a co-translator into Spanish of Paul Demand's Blindness and Insight. And with Emily Apter and Michael Wood, he is the co-editor of the Dictionary of Untranslatables. And with Paul Norse, who is with us today as well as one of the panelists and commentators on Pablo Jarsun's book, um, Jacques Lestra edits the Fordham University Press book series, Idiom. Um, this event will be in English with simultaneous interpretation from Spanish to English available through the Zoom interpretation feature. To access interpretation, click on the globe icon at, uh, to the right of the chat icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. A menu will appear and you can select the audio channel for English to hear the interpretation audio as well as the option to mute 
the original audio instead of hearing it in a lower volume with the interpretation in English. If you don't need interpretation, you can ignore this instruction. Um, I hope this, uh, uh, so it was, this was just pasted onto the chat screen as well. So if any of you uh, arrive uh, late or didn't, were unable to make sense of <laughs> my, my comment, please read the chat function. Um, one last thing, and that is about the Q&A. The chat is open, as you know, but please um, submit your questions through the Q&A icon. It will make Jacques' uh, um, task much easier than having to sift through the chat uh, uh, function. Um, so please uh, offer your questions through the Q&A. So Jacques, the, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. <clears throat> Welcome to everybody. Uh, Urbi et Orbe. And uh, I'd like to thank both Polity and the consortium for making possible this conversation about Pablo Oyarzun's wonderful book, uh, Hacer, Haciendo, Doing Justice. Um, before I introduce the panelists, just to say that they will be speaking each for about 10 minutes. After that, Pablo will be offering a small response to them. And then uh, we will open the floor, if you can call it that, for questions from, from the people who are assembled here. Uh, and I will do my best to get to as many questions as we can, but there are a lot of people who've shown up. I see that we have over 200 participants and, may, and more streaming in from all corners. So uh, very tight questions would be great. <clears throat> I'm going to offer two frames for this conversation. The panelists can reject them out of hand, of course. The frames are on first a conceptual one. I'd like to suggest that Pablo Yarthun's book forms part of what we would call the long and continuing scandal of uh, the interpretation of what Derrida called the indeconstructibility of justice. Um, scandalous for all sorts of reasons. There's some kind of interesting and productive tension between the notion that justice can be made or done and the notion that it is undeconstructible or indeconstructible. And it would be very interesting to hear a little bit about uh, ways in which that long scandal continues to play out today in the age of COVID and, uh, and of Trump. The second is the frame of the internationalization of Benjamin, uh, more specifically the reception of Benjamin in Latin America, more specifically still the reception of Benjamin in Latin America in Spanish, of which uh, Pablo Yarsun's work is a signal uh, proponent, contributor, initiator. And finally, this even smaller subset, like a box in a box in a box in a box, of Latin American receptions of Benjamin in Spanish translated into English. This is the first of the circuit of works, I think, that come back to the Anglophone world uh, in which that long and strange trajectory is, uh, is before us. What has that done to Benjamin? What has that done to us? So those are our two frames. I, as I say, I invite the panelists to reject them out of hand. Pablo Oyarzun is professor of philosophy and aesthetics and director of the Bicentennial Initiative, a project for the development of the humanities, arts, and social sciences, director of the Interdisciplinary Center of Studies in Philosophy, Art, and Humanities at the University of Chile. He's also director of the Central Research Seminar at the Art Institute of the Catholic University of Valparaiso. He's at present a board member of the Consortium of Humanities Centers and Institutes and a member of the Comité Scientifique International Associé à la Chaire Internationale de Philosophie Européenne Contemporaine of Paris 8. His research revolves around metaphysics, ethics, epistemology, and philosophy of language, aesthetics, and the theory of art and literature, culture, education, and, and politics. 
He's the author of more than 400 publications. His recent writings in English include Law, Violence, History in, critical, in the journal Critical Times, Fear and Abyss, Two Figures of Power, External Things, The Subject and Language, Lichtenberg and Kant on the concept of authority and with the writing of courage. Among his books are Devaneo sobre la estupidez y otros textos, Baudelaire, La modernidad y el destino del poema of 2016, Una especie de espejo, Swift, Cuatro ensayos y una nota of 2014, Razón del éxtasis, Estudios sobre lo sublime, on sublimity, of 2010, Rubricas, 2010, Aleta volada, 2009, Entre Celan y Heidegger, 2005, with a re-edition in 2013, El rabo del ojo, ejercicios y conatos de crítica, anestética del ready-made del 2000, year 2000, de lenguaje, historia y poder, 1999, re-edition in 2006, and El dedo de diógenes. He's also an extraordinarily prolific and an influential translator of works by Epicurus, Pseudolonginus, Swift, Kant, Kleist, Baudelaire, Kafka, Benjamin, and Celan. Our panelists, and they will go in the order in which I will introduce them, are Julia Ng, who's lecturer in critical theory and co-director of the Center for Philosophy and Critical Thought at Goldsmiths, University of London. She specializes in the links between modern mathematics, political thought, and theories of history and language in the 20th century, particularly in the work of Benjamin Publications include a dossier on Benjamin Scholem and the Marburg School, 2012, Werner Hamacher's Two Studies of Friedrich Hölderlin in Stanford, 2020, and the new translation and critical edition of Benjamin's Toward the Critique of Violence and Associated Writings, which is forthcoming with Stanford in June, now in just a couple of months. She's currently at work on a project examining the crossovers between mathematical, philosophical, and political modes of being, thinking, and acting from Descartes to Benjamin, and another entitled Taoism and Capitalism, which is based around Benjamin and Weber's respective images of China, ancient and modern. Paul North teaches literature and critical theory at Yale University. He's written four books, The Problem of Distraction, Stanford, 2012, about the benefits of not thinking, The Yield, Kafka's A Theological Reformation, Stanford, 2015, about how not to use power. Um, there's a lot of not in, in Paul's thinking. Um, uh, bizarre, uh, uh, The Yield, Kafka's A Theological Reformation is about how not to use power. Bizarre privileged items in the universe, the logic of likeness. Zone Books 2021, about a cosmos where there are no beings and no being, only likenesses, and the standpoint of Marx's capital, which is in progress and provides an interpretation of that book. He's also the co-editor of a new English critical edition of Capital Volume 1, coming out with Princeton in 2022. M. Tai is assistant professor of literature at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They received a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in English with a designated emphasis in critical theory. Tai is currently writing a book about Walter Benjamin's solidarity with all that is objected from the category of the human. And with that, I hand off the screen to Julia Ng. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Jacques for the introduction and uh, thank you um, to the um, Critical Theory Program uh, for having this event and uh, really giving me the opportunity to engage with a truly thought inspiring book um, that I found was such a pleasure to read. And um, what I wanna do in these prepared remarks is um, follow one of the trains of thoughts, um, by no means exhaustive, um, but one of them in particular that I hope um, will actually um, draw out um, what unbeknownst to me were going to be Jacques's two frameworks <laughs> for uh, situating the discussion, namely, uh, what do we do after Derrida's foster loi and the diagnosis of this, what he thinks is an undecidability in the possibility of justice, 
as derives from Benjamin. And on the other hand, also um, an international reception, an international sort of resituation of where Benjamin sits, especially within Latin America. Um, I'm going to flip around both of those in a little, in, in a way that will hopefully be apparent very shortly. But anyway, the strain of thought I wanted to follow is um, really defined by one question, which is what is the temporality in which no one lives and from which no one returns? Um, to me, this is the question that poses itself in the prologue already of doing justice and is taken up over and again as a reframe, not only through the book's three chapters, but also through the three decades of thinking that these chapters span. Again, what time does no one live in and from which no one returns? It is a question that is on the one hand perennial and yet poses itself repeatedly because as Pablo Oyerzun suggests, the very grammar with which we are bound to express time intervenes in any prospect that the return of no one's time might not return and not reinscribe in the expression of its full horror, the very condition for the possibility of its return. Thus, for instance, when we utter the words never again to signify where justice will be done, this demand to do justice as much to repair as to bear witness to a truth that has not had time to obtain, this demand hews to a conception of time that renders the doing of justice, the doing of what is unprecedented and thus, in terms of the requirements of experience, certainty and knowledge for a basic structure of ground and consequence, strictly speaking, a prospect of which neither certainty nor knowledge may be had. And the future tense that expresses the demand, justice will be done, likewise obscures under that reflexive pronoun se, with which its passive voice is constructed in the Spanish, the person in whom the capacity to complete the deed is invested. Yet this obscured person also stands in solidarity with all those who are pressed into oblivion by the sheer force by which state apparatuses, state apparatuses enforce their power into being. As such, and I quote, justice will be done, no one will do it. No one is the place where that which comes in me imminently dwells and lingers. Benjamin gave that which comes an impersonal name, the messianic. According to this most rigorous thinking on the possibility of justice, the temporality to which the doing of justice corresponds must therefore be in, uh, indeterminate. It represents, as Oyajun says, not any particular outcome that will have been achieved by anyone to come, but rather all the time and pure imminence. It is properly speaking an arrival that is, as Benjamin writes in respect to what he calls a pure immediate form of violence, free of ulterior and exterior motives, and therefore completes itself in itself as justice that will be done. Speaking with Orazun, and not just in this sense, is of course Benjamin, who writes in the final sentence of Toward the Critic of Violence that, quote, divine violence, which the sign and seal, but never the means of sacred dispatch, may be called pending, or waltende violence, waltende gewalt. But what is all this time in which justice will be done as a pure immediate violence that neither attends its execution, a shalt in der Gewalt, nor expends itself in the effort to preserve itself as verwaltete Gewalt, but rather remains pending, waltende, as a reserve without effect. Tellingly for Oyazun, it is not just anyone, but no one who will do justice and to no one that justice will be done. And specifically in regard to Benjamin's thinking, doing justice is to do justice to no one's capacity to do justice. Benjamin may have given to this no one the name messianic at one point, but no one assumes other names as well, other non-arbitrary names, such as the creaturely, material of creation, zahe or thing as such, and in the 1916 notes on the category of justice, the good to which a good right is said to accrue to the extent that the right to possess said object does not apply. That is to say, this good, the highest specification of which Benjamin says should be the goal of justice to strive to make the world, correlates roughly to that which falls outside of what Kant would call the rightful conditions under which all things, however they were first acquired, can be called mine, whether or not I hold on to it with physical force, i.e., if I may be permitted to free, uh, paraphrase Kant, falling outside of the intelligible rules that legitimize colonization. 
This is not to mention the multifarious objects, both quotidian and peculiar, that Benjamin was known to have collected, and that in the vast reserve of his writing, do things that fall willfully outside of the schemata by which their efficacy or productivity might be measured. They break down, they hover as clouds, they gesture without discernible purpose. Most telling though, perhaps, is a fragment that Benjamin composed around 1915 or 1916 in the context of a conversation with Sholem on the topic of philosophy and myth that begins with the words, paganism is a demonic community. According to a small schema Benjamin sketches there, no one, niemand, belongs in a dyad with humanity or menschheit under the category of Christian revelation to which two further specifications are then added. In relationship to human humanity, no one is human and not the law. So no one, niemand is mensch and not gazettes, not the law. In contrast to Judaism, he writes, of which Benjamin writes that revelation reveals the relationship of people or folk to the law, gazettes, Christian revelation reveals the relation of humanity to that which is not the law, which of course is also no one who is human. Now out of the overflow of signification ensuing here, there is no one in humanity who is human and does not abide by the law of humanity. And humanity is revealed in relationship to a non-law that is somehow also not human. There emerges a demand that no one be understood in its demonic capacity of lurking both inside and outside the grammar of Christian histori historiography. A couple of notes that Benjamin makes two years later in 1918 further clarifies these equivalences as follows. The doctrine of original qua inherited sin, erbsünde, is Christian. Judaism, by contrast, rejects the notion of original inherited sin placing importance instead on the integrity of guilt or schuld as unwitting or inadvertent. Thus for Judaism, quote, not life, but rather only the acting human being can become guilty. That is in respect to a particular law, which is say gazettes rather than recht or law as such. For religions that entertain a concept of natural guilt by contrast, quote, life is always somehow guilty and the punishment for it is death. Several years later still in 1921, the year he composes toward the critique of violence, Benjamin reflects in a fragment on the meaning of time in the moral world that in contrast to modern law, which imposes a statute of limitations on the punishability of even murder, limiting it therefore to a single lifetime, earlier forms of retributive force were seen to extend across generations such that it might be said that, quote, retribution is at bottom indifferent with respect to time, insofar as it remains undiminished in force through the centuries. This, Benjamin writes, is the result of a picture that is actually pagan that arranges the last judgment, jüngste Gericht, as the deadline when all delay is canceled with full retribution setting in. At the same time, this thinking on judgment fails to apprehend the fact that its own anxious insistence on judgment's universalizable instantaneity takes shape in time, and indeed in a peculiar time form that sees the universal instant perpetually playing catch up with the time or day of judgment, the force of which blows in quite the other direction in the mode of an always already futural storm of forgiveness that rolls ahead of retribution and also without whose resistance retribution itself has no force. Now, one way to comprehend this image is that according to the pagan character of law, as he calls it uh, again later in Capitalism as Religion, which itself remains insensible to the, poss uh, the possibility, retributive force constitutes itself in and as a confrontation with the force of forgiveness which has always already erased the traces of retribution's markings in the sands of time, though without subsiding into reconciliation, because the force of forgiveness is also simply time, all of time in its pure duration. In all this time, then, there is no one who is originally guilty and no one is originally guilty. 
Most importantly, it seems that we lack a grammar for this no one. Inasmuch as our grammar, unlike perhaps those whose syntax is arranged around the primacy of verbs, for instance, in Chinese, rather than nouns like in English or Spanish, allows for no mood or tense that expresses the whole time, except in the form of paradoxes that ensue from the attempts to grasp the whole time that rely on a substantivized notion of no one as not being, as not one, and therefore as anyone who runs afoul of the not law, to which anyone is indebted for one's mere possibility of existing and enjoying and procreating, in a word, for living. No one, therefore, finds expression in other linguistic physiognomies, among them rhyme, as demonstrated by the final sentence of Toward the Critic of Violence, and of which Benjamin wrote, apropos Karl Kaus, that it ascends out of the creaturely world. Or, as in one of the dreams that he recounts in One Way Street, no one inhabits a filled time beyond all remembrance and forgetting, in which the struggle between remembrance and forgetting itself surfaces. In the piece that's entitled Structural Engineering Works, Tiefbau Arbeiten from Einbahnstraße, Benjamin writes, and I quote, I saw in a dream a bleak terrain. That was the marketplace of Weimar. Excavations were taking place there. I too scraped a bit in the sand. There the spire of a church tower emerged. Highly pleased, I thought to myself, a Mexican shrine from the time of preanimism, from the Anna Kwevitzli. I awoke with laughter. Open parenthesis, Anna V. Witz Mexican Church. In brief, the source of this Witz or joke at the end is probably the bilingual Spanish Nahuatl dictionary composed by the missionary linguist Fray Alonso de Molina the Vocabulario en Lengua Castellana y Mexicana, which was first published in 1555. Scholem recalls that he saw Molina's dictionary on Benjamin's desk in Berlin sometime after 1916, when Benjamin apparently undertook the project to learn Nahuatl. In the mid 1920s, Benjamin revisited his study of ancient Mesoamerican language and culture, which he had begun in 1915 under the tutelage of a docent called Bautaliman and to whom Benjamin later sent an off print of Toward the Critique of Violence. In return, Lehman recommends him a book on Aztec law by the um, historian of law, Josef Kola, to aid in his endeavor to come up with a more fully developed critique of violence. Which, what Kola presents as Aztec law though, is a legal system fashioned in the spirit of historical continuity and in the image of European natural legality. Kohler lauds the Aztecs for their legal systematicity on the basis of their excluding the indigenous right to self-defense. It is in short, a legal monstrosity. Benjamin's account of his dream counters with a joke comprised of an invented word, anaquivitzli, which has two possible provenances in Molina's dictionary. First, the word Molina transcribes as anaquilitzli and defines as lo mesma es que anaconi, so the same as anaconi, which he in turn dis, uh, defines as cosa no necesaria, ilicita y, y sin provecho, think of no, no necessity of illicit nature and without benefit. The second possible source, proceeding from the dream's manifest content this time, is the entry for iglesia or church to which Molina assigns the Nahuatl word Teocali, which actually happens to be the actual term for an Aztec flat top pyramid. These two items, the thing of no necessity of illicit nature and without benefit on the one hand, and the Spanish Teocali, which is an object excavated from a dream whose emergence is the result not of a promise, contract or gift, but of a struggle and a violent act of extraction. These two items, I wager, are what inhabit the same time as no one. But therefore, this time is freely given and free to give back and mark out conditions for the possibility for a reparation that lets the struggle surface instead of forcing it to settle. Thanks. Thank you so much, Julia. Paul, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jacques. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Pablo, for this incredibly generous thinking 
which is also, as you'll see if you read the book, very precise in its movement. So I have to apologize in advance that my movement is not nearly as precise. I think this belongs to the frame of the Derridian scandal that Jacques um, mentioned. And I also think I might be completely ignoring that scandal. So in any case, I'll read what I have. One thing among the many things that one should save and put on display from this stunning collection of essays is its treatment out in the open with no fear of a particular problem. You can call it a philosophical problem, but it's more than this. It's obvious from the title that the book wants to talk about justice, and it reveals against a whole history of conceptualizations that justice is not a thing or a concept, but an act, a doing. It is the object of justice, however, that I find the most astonishing and worthy of citing and putting on display. Whether it's thought of as conformity to the law or conformity to a particular law or as restitution in a historical balance of goods, justice has been routinely over millennia considered to have as its object a person or a society treated as a person that can be wounded and healed or a legal person with particular rights ascribed to it that can be given and taken away and given back in an act. In these three critical essays by Pablo Oyarzun, written over almost as many decades, which study a selection of texts by another critical essayist, Walter Benjamin, justice does not apply to persons or groups, legal or moral. Justice can be done, to say it using Oyarzun's theoretical coup de grace, for experience. The question that animates the three essays is, I'm wagering, again, this moves away from the very precise movement, but Maybe there's some value in speaking coarsely. The question that animates the essays is how? How can you do justice in and for experience? This question is interesting because among all the objects for which justice can be done, among all the precincts where justice has proceeded with its procedures, experience has accompanied them to be sure, but it's rarely cited as a thing in its own right. Take the law. One moment in which justice will be done is in court, in its scene and the specific drama that takes place there. And no matter how grievous the wrong done by the defendant, the wrongs done by the court proceeding itself from arrest to execution of the verdict is never mentioned. It does not count as a wrong. That is because I want to say following Oyarsun, the wrong done by justice is done to experience while the wrong that justice is concerned with is the wrong done to a principle, a law, a structure, a table of values. In short, a formal entity like a contract whose terms can be made into a demand to conform. You can see that under this definition of justice, even a dictatorship with its kangaroo courts and travesties of justice can hold to something like an idea of justice, at least insofar as principles reign and are imposed regardless of the consequences in and for experience. I wonder if justice is just another name for that sentiment, quote, so much the worse for experience, unquote. I'm quoting myself, so I don't know why I said that. In any case, with respect to the experience of those undergoing justice, a legitimate process is unjust in and for experience in similar ways to an illegitimate process. So the accused is ripped from their life and doing, subdued, submitted, retrospectively commanded to respect principles to which they only tacitly, if that, agreed, kin and friend ties broken, the shape of everyday life changed irreparably. Justice is done for the principle, for the life of the principle. The experience of the subject of justice be damned. And so this is a very exciting idea, justice in and for experience. It would mean possibly that in a court where justice is supposed to happen, justice, justice would have to happen also in the experience of going through the procedure and being taken and being made to speak to a past act defined by the law and having to organize your speech in legal categories and being submitted and subjected and so on. The mechanism of justice would then have its canon of justice. And this obviously might mean, I think, the end to justice in a legal sense. This is an extreme case where a legal regime and its highest good, justice, collides with the milieu of experience. Outside the law and its justice, what would it mean to do justice in and for experience? We are soon, as I take it, tracks this question doggedly over these decades and in these essays. 
in which experience under military dictatorship and its principles morphed seamlessly into the dictatorship of the market and its principles. In the most recent text, the prologue, he formulates one of the qualities of experience that make it anathema to principles, to wit, quote, an experience always overflows its context, unquote. As is evident in the form and content of this statement, these essays are not constrained by the Chilean context, but they do make clear part of its larger significance. In an era of rule by principles, such as the dictatorship or the neoliberal market, experience as a threatened species blazes into appearance as radically different from principle and in dire need of being thought through. What would it mean then to do justice in and for experience? Experience for Benjamin, as Oyarsun makes clear, is not categorial, but dislocating. Oyarsun argues this on the very important set of pages, really absolutely crucial reading for anyone working on justice, pages 48 to 50. I can be Talmudic about it in the second essay. If experience in the epoch described by Benjamin is, as Oyarsun often puts it, not just particular in Aristotle's sense, but profoundly singular, meaning, I think, unrepeatable, if its relationship to death further makes experience into a mode of decay, quote, the essentially withering condition of that which is, unquote, if it occurs, quote, in the imminence of danger, unquote, and as a, quote, transformative fit of dizziness, unquote, this is about experience, what kind of justice can be expected for it? And what would justice mean? I take this to be Oyarsun's reading of a great arc of concern spanning most of Benjamin's writing and linking up in some sense, Jacques, I think with Derrida's work. In the case of Benjamin, I would put the question this way, is it possible to do justice in and for experience without requiring experience to conform to a law outside it? It's a Kantian question and an anti-Kantian question at the same time. To quote Oyarsun, this would be a justice in which, quote, the creature is not judged, unquote. That is an experience without a law. Once again, what would justice look like in and for an experience without a law? It can't look like the imposition of a law. I take this to be the question behind many of the readings in this book. There's a corollary to this question, one that I think Benjamin was thinking through, especially in conjunction with Kafka, and that is that experience is what we call what happens beneath, over, to the side of, or in the shadowy corners of a lawful order. And yet, insofar as you proscribe experience with even a minimalistic principle like this, even if you try to hold it to what seems like an anti-principle, saying that experience is what does not happen by principle, that it is transient, singular, transformative, even chaotic, you nonetheless hold over it the specter of a court in which it could be judged. So this is my question to you, Pablo, and I think it's a challenge to my own understanding, maybe even of Derrida. The danger to experience under the question of justice is that whenever you articulate what experience is, you're potentially introducing an instrument of justice that could be carried out onto or against it. You run the risk that what you say might be taken as a principle of exclusion, of judgment, of punishment, or even in a better case of restitution of the proper goods to experience. Thus the particular problem, philosophical but going beyond philosophy, is that for experience with even a minimal or even an anti-principle, it's hard to imagine what doing justice, sorry, for experience without a minimal principle. It's hard to imagine what doing justice would mean. Or to say it another way, for justice ever to be done in and for experience, whatever its consistency, justice would have to radically change its shape. It can no longer mean conformity to a law or restitution of a predetermined balance of goods. I'm not sure that Benjamin would agree with this, and I want to ask Professor Oyarsun Paolo if he agrees with it. Pushed to its extreme limit, experience would have to approach a no principle. And justice in that case would not be the term in which to talk about its goods. I take it that the first step in transforming justice away from something to do with imposing and judging adherence to principles 
is to think what justice would mean for transformative dizzying experience to begin with. That's why I think Oyarsun insists in the prologue as he's revisiting these essays that justice is already in its concept an experienceable thing. It's not a logical operation among statements or a violent procedure among bodies. It has to accede to one of experiences, categories, doing, hacer. Whether this then itself becomes a principle by which we could judge experience and whether experience can be imagined without such a court is a question that I want to ask him. Okay, that's what I have. Thank you so much, Paul. Em, the, the, the floor is yours and the dogs I apologize for. <laughs> you should never apologize for the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, what follows is not really a paper so much as it is a, a extended thank you note. Uh, mil gracias, Pablo, uh, for this work of reading and for this experience of translation. These essays written from and through Lima, Santiago and Caracas, I renewed Benjamin by bringing his thought into a new idiom, another afterlife. Where Benjamin writes of Stillstand, Pablo brings us to hear this phrase anew as dialectics in a state of detention and arrest. Where Benjamin writes of the kinship of languages, Pablo listens not for how translations ultimately wind up saying the same thing, but instead how through translation, the querer decir, the wanting to say of disparate languages comes to supplement one another. Where Benjamin speaks of Einfa, Pablo describes how experience strikes, quote, like a transformative fit of dizziness, which takes you out of the capitals of your present knowing. And where Benjamin evokes that difficult term, pure language, Pablo reminds us that this purity does not refer to some primordial identity, but to the shards of disparate tongues that persist in a space of resonance. When Benjamin speaks of the philosophy of history, Pablo says, quote, the past remains pending. And in response to Benjamin's theses on the concept of history, Pablo wonderfully offers four suggestions about experience. I wanted to mark the last of these gestures that is of offering a suggestion as a way to meet the gravity of the thesis. But this gesture draws together in a flash, I think some of the touchstones of Paulo's account of justice and of his practice of reading more generally. Pablo brings some of Benjamin's most trafficked essays into an idiomatic adjustment that in resonance with the weak messianic arrival that he draws into focus, does not burst in with the bravura of a spectacular show of force, but acts through minor alterations that somehow make all the difference. I should also mark that the book does not stage a platonic investigation of what justice is. Rather, the writing collect collected here is writing that has been pressed by an urgency that is often left unnamed to consider how justice might be done. How will justice be done for the desaparecidos who in their disappearance, as Pablo writes, have been denied their mortality? Following Benjamin for Pablo, the promise of justice's fulfillment is not grounded in the force of the law. As we know from Benjamin's critique of violence, the order of legal right, while it may very often front as the proper house of justice, incarcerates its subjects within a mythic context of life destroying guilt. And so Pablo breaks justice away from the force field of law and he resituates its difficult hopes within the topos of language in the quotation that destructively rips a text from its context, but in doing so calls back its origin. In the storyteller who does not pass judgment, but instead gives creature and stone room to play. And in the ambiguity of the passive voice, which accommodates a tyrannical dissimulation of agency, it was executed, but we don't know by whom, but at the same time leaves room for the impersonal yet emancipatory force of the messianic shift. Together, these readings yield a vision of a promise of justice that is formed by different points of light. 
And one of them is what Pablo refers to as a weak power. A weak power which does not strong arm the past into the interests of the present, but in Pablo's words, quote, welcomes what has passed of the past, receives it, and at the same time resists its capitalization in the present. Weak power, he continues, does not erase the erasure that does not cease to be reproduced. There is a strange temporality at work in this formulation, which involves a weird persistence of the past through a present that continuously effaces it always and always again. In an essay on Kafka, Benjamin suggests that just because something has been forgotten doesn't mean that it doesn't extend to the present. On the contrary, he writes, quote, it is present by virtue of this very oblivion. And in a virtuosic use of citation, Benjamin then cuts to an early note of Kafka's in which he writes, quote, I have an experience of seasickness on dry land. This power to res resist the regime of the is, Pablo associates with the play of evocation. Evocation, these are his words, is not a purely spontaneous act of conjuring up something already deceased at will, like I seize the dead and bring it into my service, but it is, quote, a hearkening to a vocation that calls from the echo of dead voices. The oppressed past is received rather than appropriated, is listened for rather than mined from the country of loss. And perhaps something of this weak power which resists the course of the world precisely because it remembers forgetting is transformed into a hermeneutic disposition that orients Pablo's readings. In his book, Benjamin is not, as he very often is, simply airlifted and dumped into an argument to serve its ends. Rather, Pablo reads Benjamin with the practice of Aufmerksamkeit, or the attentiveness with which Benjamin's storyteller is said to meet devastated experience. Pablo's readings of Benjamin's philosophy of history do not then proceed by adding more theses to the canon, nor does he attempt to break the theses down. Instead, the middle essay of the book offers what he titles Four Suggestions. As a critical gesture to offer suggestions in response to a set of theses is to read in a way that does not meet force with force. The suggestion is something that accepts its own transience, make an offer, makes an offering to truth without making a hard claim for staying power. And there's also something funny about it. I keep imagining this scene. Benjamin walks into a bar and he says, I have 12 theses. And then 61 years later, Pablo comes in and says, oh, but wait, I have four suggestions for you. <laughs> and this brings me to the uh, other point of light that forms Pablo's vision of the promise of justice, which is humor. Pablo turns attention toward that claim of Benjamin's that, quote, this, this is amazing, all humor has its origin in justice, but certainly in a justice that considers not human beings, but rather things to be important. There is uh, a little infinity of conversation that could be generated solely from Pablo's reading of this remark. So I've been speaking of the ways in which Pablo's study points us to what he calls the quote, justice of the trivial. These are readings, however, that equally have an eye toward death or rather death roves all over and throughout this vision of how justice may be sentenced. Readers may perhaps feel as I did that there is some kind of hollow that separates the prologue from the subsequent essays. In the opening remarks, Pablo suggests that, quote, perhaps interminable time is what the process of mourning requires. Here, his reflections on temporality are pressed in on by the nunca mas of the desaparecidos and the always and for always of regimes of dictatorial continuity. And perhaps between the two, there's something of the seasickness on dry land of which Kafka spoke. In Pablo's readings of Benjamin's philosophy of language and history, the desaparecidos and the violence of the Chilean dictatorship recede from being named explicitly. 
Yet some of the most moving moments in Pablo's exegesis perhaps bear the inscription of the Desaparecidos being still very much around, such as when Pablo writes, quote, thinking the historical truth demands that we keep open the posthumous aperture to signification and do so out of knowledge that such an opening expires. Or when he's glossing Benjamin's strange account of language, Pablo writes, quote, the mark of being is never present to itself. It consists in nothing but being positioned on the edge of its own disappearance in danger. I bring these forth not in the attempt to drain these readings into an empirical plane of historical referentiality or to empty them into the brutality of fact, but perhaps I want simply to ask after a certain distance that the essays take from a terrain in which the violence of dictatorship rises to the explicit mark. What is it to write in that distance and to generate that distance in writing? I speak of a certain remove knowing at the same time that the book remains very, very close to mourning what is disappeared. This practice of mourning does not resurrect its object for view, but like pigment that is thrown into water is permeated throughout so that it is scarcely visible, but somehow everywhere seen. Maybe we can give some time to this in our conversation. But I wanna close with, um, an offering of a small story that was renewed for me through reading Pablo's book, in particular by his attention to Benjamin's intuition that justice might arrive through the improbable avenue of humor. There is an anecdote that Kafka recounts in a letter to Felice, which never fails to make me laugh and laugh. And I'm gonna try not to laugh too hard right now. So Kafka's at work one day and at this point, he's pretty much the lowest employee in the company. The president, who is so important that Kafka imagines him to be an emperor, is making some kind of meaningless speech and delivering it with great conviction. And for some reason, Kafka starts to giggle. And he tries to get himself together. At first, he's laughing only occasionally at the trite jokes that the president makes. And he manages to pass off his giggling as a tickle in the throat. But soon it gets worse and his colleague shoots him a look of caution. So Kafka tries harder to repress his laughter, but doing so just reminds him, quote, vividly of the joys of his earlier laughter. <laughs> At this point, he can no longer restrain himself and he's laughing so much and so hard out loud, looking straight at the president because he's trying to avoid any change that might make things worse. And now other people also seem to be infected by laughter. And at this moment, Kafka writes, when, quote, I was in full spate, I was, of course, laughing not only at the current jokes, but at those of the past, the future, and the whole lot together. So it's one thing to laugh at a joke, but Kafka finds himself laughing at all jokes that have ever come to pass. <laughs> Laughter bursts on upon the present and interrupts authoritative speech without directly contesting it. But then this interruptive force is itself burst open by all historical laughters and the immense force of past laughters interruption of the present is somehow the opening toward the laughter of all jokes to come. If I might borrow a phrasing of Pablo's, uh, this fit of giggling quote, destroys the plexus of the opposition in the moment of its emergence. I wonder Pablo, uh, how for you, the interminability of mourning and of laughter might traverse each other. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that concludes the panelists' interventions. And now, Pablo, if I may hand over to you the really heavy responsibility of answering these three wonderful, wonderful interventions. Adelante. Yeah, sure. The, <clears throat> I, I have to thank these wonderful talks. I, I'm very moved by these talks, indeed. Um, well, I, I, I will speak as a, a, a bit in English at the beginning, and then I surely I have to switch to Spanish. 
Um, I want to thank in the first place uh, the critical theory from ICCTP, uh, Natalia, Leticia, all the uh, uh, <clears throat> all the people working at this uh, wonderful series, this quality press series on critical global. How is called? How it is called? Global Critical South. Um, and I'm very honored to be part of this uh, project with this uh, little book. Um, um, what can I say? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's, of course, it's a heavy responsibility. And I'm not uh, uh, sure I can do something that can do justice to all these uh, talks. So I, um, I think I will switch now to Spanish in order to speak a bit more uh, fluently. Um, so I, I, I guess we have the uh, interpreter fun function and I want to thank Marcy, which is our interpreter, uh, for, the, uh, for her work. And um, bueno, ahora empiezo a hablar en castellano. Voy a tratar de hacerlo lentamente, no como chileno, hablamos muy rápido los chilenos. Eh, y en primer lugar, de, me, creo que arrancaría de un lugar que mencionó M hacia el final respecto de un cierto hiato que habría entre el prólogo y los tres ensayos, que ciertamente es un hiato temporal, o sea, es un hiato, ob, un hiato obviamente cronológico, el prólogo está escrito para este libro. Nunca pensé reunir estos, eh, esto es un regalo inesperado, es un unexpected gift, in, oh, two gifts are unexpected, uh, un regalo inesperado de Quality Press, de Natalia, de <coughs> Leticia, de todo el equipo, uh, <coughs> porque me hizo pensar, me hizo de, en primer lugar volver a estos textos para hacer la revisión de la traducción inglesa, Eh, y al volver a estos textos también sentir el tiempo. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I'm reading here that the simultaneous, simultaneous translation is totally incorrect. I, I don't think so. I, I don't expect that it's incorrect. Um, but I try to speak in English. Um, <clears throat> I was saying that um, uh, writing this uh, prologue to my book, I had to, I had to, um, get a sense of the temporal distance between my actual, my present writing and uh, the writing of these uh, three essays uh, across uh, almost 19 years or something like that. And um, <clears throat> I think this is something that has to do with time, with, uh, as Julia was talking about time. Um, Oh, the work you, it's fine, yeah. Okay, Erin is, so I switched to Spanish again. So I think it's, it's, it's okay with the translation. Sorry, sorry. But bueno, lo que decía es que me parece que uh, esto tiene que ver con lo que decía Julia al principio acerca del tiempo y una manera de relacionarse, oh, no sé si relacionarse con el tiempo, de estar en el tiempo, que es particularmente, <coughs> En cierto modo es desubjetivadora, por decirlo así. No one de alguna manera aparece ahí también, aparece en uno ese no one. Cuando uno se da cuenta de que escribió por ciertas razones que no estaban presentes cuando, cuando eso se escribió, ciertas razones que tenían que ver con todo lo que había pasado en Chile, con toda la experiencia que habíamos tenido de la dictadura, Yo uso la palabra experiencia en el doble sentido, común y corriente, y un poco en el sentido en que se ha comentado aquí. Uh, <coughs> y uh, yo diría que, eh, lo que lo que me ocurrió fue fundamentalmente experimentar esta, este, este lapso temporal, eh, dándome cuenta de que había escrito por esa razón. Eh, no era algo que estuviese, como decía, presente en ese momento, que estuviese pre absolutamente presente, que escribir estos textos sobre Benjamin de alguna manera era responder a la experiencia de los años de dictadura y también a la experiencia de los años anteriores a la dictadura de la 
el régimen de Salvador Allende de la Unidad Popular. Eh, pensando un poco en la cuestión, y por eso decía, no estoy en condiciones de responder adecuadamente a las eh, increíblemente eh, buenas, eh, estupendas eh, intervenciones de Julia, de M y de Paul, um, eh, Pensando en eso, recordé un hecho, recordé algo que tiene que ver con lo que está ocurriendo hoy día en Chile, con lo que ha ocurrido. Ustedes saben que hemos tenido una suerte de revuelta popular eh, muy intensa en todo el periodo final del año 19, que después fue, terminó siendo interrumpida por la pandemia, um, pero desde luego no se, ha, no se ha apagado y no se ha callado aún, y es una revuelta, una revuelta que tiene que ver justamente con esta suerte de retorno de extraño retorno del tiempo, de extraño retorno de un tiempo pasado como pasado, que sigue marcando su diferencia con el presente, pero que retorna a ese presente justamente vaciándolo de su propia actualidad. Y con eso estoy pensando en algo que uh, mencionaba Julia, uh, bueno, algo que ha estado presente en todo lo que se ha dicho aquí, que es, recuerdo lo que decía Benjamin al final de la crítica de la violencia, Julia citaba ese o, o hacía referencia a ese lugar que inmediatamente precede a las frases finales. Uh, los seres humanos no están en condiciones de, ni tampoco tienen la urgencia de saber cuándo uh, la violencia divina ha operado, por así decirlo, cuándo se ha manifestado la violencia divina en la historia. Um, no, no, tienen, eh, no, no pueden, no tienen la, las condiciones para saberlo, ni tampoco tienen la urgencia para saberlo solo, la violencia legal, la violencia mítica, está a la vista, solo ella es cierta, solo ella puede ser ciertamente conocida. La incerteza respecto de la violencia divina es radical. Ahí también donde ocurre una revolución. Pensaba, en el caso chileno, de lo que había sido uh, la instancia de la ley en la época de la unidad popular, y pensaba también por qué podía volver de alguna manera ese pasado de la unidad popular en el estallido social chileno, en la revuelta popular, ¿por qué podían volver a cantarse las canciones de esa época? ¿Por qué podían volver a, a eh, gritarse las consignas de aquella época como si fueran una suerte de revenot, de, pero un revenot que vuelve a cobrar una cierta, uno tendría que decir, débil fuerza? Y pensaba cómo había sido la situación de la ley en la unidad popular y curiosamente recordé lo que más escandalizaba a la oposición al gobierno de Allende y es que se utilizaran lo que se llamó en esa época resquicios. Hubo un gran abogado que se llamaba Novoa Monreal, que fue el <coughs> creador de esta operación, que consistía en <coughs> filtrar la ley existente con los mismos artículos de la ley, con artículos viejos, incluso del siglo XIX, que permitía modificar o aprovechar ciertas instancias para ir transformando, uh, la, uno diría fundamentalmente transformando el derecho de propiedad en Chile, que será el, el objetivo central de, de la acción uh, de la unidad popular. Entonces la unidad popular nunca instauró ninguna ley, ese es un caso absolutamente, <coughs> de alguna manera pienso que era el retorno de la unidad popular, que fue lo que me hizo escribir ese prólogo tratando de volver a conectarme con eso y con la cuestión de la justicia, justamente. Eh, pensando desde Benjamin, creo que diría que algo así como el hecho de no haber una ley que uno pudiera atribuir a la unidad popular, la suerte, esa suerte de abstinencia legal, la abstinencia de la instauración de la ley, dejó a la unidad popular en una situación muy, muy peculiar, pues lo dejó, la dejó una suerte de limbo histórico. Y ese limbo histórico que de alguna manera recorre el tiempo, es el que le permite que algo así como esto suceda. Uh, no, podría, no podría olvidar un verso, un par de versos de Paul Celan, que son, no me acuerdo de qué libro de Paul Celan, pero son, uh, traducido en inglés sería algo así como, There are still songs to sing beyond the human. Me parece que <coughs> eso tiene que ver muy centralmente, ese beyond the human del cantar Beyond the Human, como una suerte de insistencia, por así decir, en, eh, en, en el tiempo y en la experiencia, creo que tiene mucho que ver con lo que nos ha sucedido, 
con lo que ha terminado sucediendo en Chile, en términos políticos, en términos históricos, en términos también experienciales. Eh, Paul preguntaba, Paul decía, uh, eh, hacía la pregunta, ¿no es cierto? Um, ¿Cómo, uh, cómo, uh, how to, um, how can you do justice in and for experience without a minimal principle? I think this was the, the question. I, th I think it is impossible. I, th I think it is impossible that, I think that, but that this minimal principle is uncertainty. It is precisely that, it is, it is a principle of uncertainty and, this, and it is as an uncertain principle too. I think that's, that's is something that is uh, uh, located in this phrase of Benjamin that I, that I was quoting, uh, badly quoting a moment ago about the uh, revolutionary moment and about the impossibility to know if this is a manifestation is, a, is the uh, event of, our, of divine violence. Um, I, I think that this, is, this could be a, a response to your question. Esto podría ser una respuesta a tu pregunta. Y creo que también tiene que ver con la cuestión de la justicia. Tiene que ver con que la justicia está en ese lugar de la, de la incerteza, de la incertidumbre. O sea, es el how to do justice y, y justice to be done abre ese tiempo justamente, abre el tiempo de la incertidumbre. No nos, no nos deja tranquilos, dicho de otra manera. No nos deja ningún lugar en el cual podamos reposar y quedarnos eh, aquietados, sosegados, como si algo de ese uh, justice will be done eh, hubiese ocurrido. Um, me parece que eso es algo que tal vez podría decirse. Eh, y bueno, tenía muchas más, me anoté muchas cosas, pero como les digo, quedé muy abrumado también por vuestras eh, intervenciones que tengo que repasar cuidadosamente. Um, una, una nota solamente. Suggestions, en el segundo ensayo, se llamaba en castellano señas, algo así como hints. Pero señas, hints son, son señas, son eh, indicaciones totalmente inciertas, justamente. O sea que lo que intentan es trabajar, es, por así decir, negociar con la incerteza, eh, sin poder abandonarla, sin poder eh, irse de ese lugar. Y me parece que es también el lugar de la justicia. Creo que eso podría decir por ahora, porque realmente estoy como en mucha dificultad de poder hacerme cargo de todo lo que ustedes han dicho, que yo agradezco infinitamente, porque ha sido, el, como decía, los verdaderos regalos son inesperados y este ha sido un regalo totalmente inesperado. Así que muchas gracias. Thank you. Uh, gracias, Pablo. Thank you so much, Pablo. Thank you to the panelists. And now I'd, I'd love to throw this open to our many, many participants. Uh, if you would formulate questions and put them in the little Q&A panel. Uh, we have at the moment one uh, cluster of questions that concern the, uh, the way in which the hypotheses about doing justice may or may not uh, return to an authentic discussion that concerns the uh, uh, alternative traditions, traditions alternative to the Western formulations regarding justice and law, which in the, uh, the questioner says, are, um, we have lost faith in because these seem arbitrary and don't attend to matters of ethics, matters of value, instead are primarily legalistic. Uh, I wonder if um, perhaps, uh, Julia, you had some observations about the question of the, the colony uh, that might be, uh, that might serve as a way into asking the question of whether the notion of justice at issue here is 
an enlightened Western notion or whether there are claims to universality beyond that and whether those claims can be formulated without taking account of a colonial situation? Um, yeah, so part of what I was trying to um, uncover with um, what I saw was a refrain of this no one, um, which Pablo obviously um, recast, uh, um, I, if I understood the remarks correctly, I, I was listening to the simultaneously translation, but, um, you know, on the, what I was trying to suggest is like, you know, there, there's a, there is a, uh, I guess, a way that has become conventional, especially within readings of Benjamin's essay, and especially as Jacques was saying at the outset, represented by Derrida's reading of the essay, right? That turns on a what he calls undecidability, and obviously that's also it's also questionable whether undecidability really, <laughs> you know, really is applicable to what Benjamin is saying is 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 the character of divine violence, that violence that just happens without one's knowing and therefore gives an opportunity, right? As you were saying. Um, there's nevertheless a human to war to a uh, concept of time that is still sort of unreconstructed insofar as that very distinction between the occurrence that has no ulterior motive and that which it's that which it is supposedly sort of interrupting itself is dependent on a concept of time that that itself is happening within time in a particular sense and so that's sort of what i was trying to unpack a little bit with having rediscovered um actually as i was reading your book benjamin's own like recalling of the no one in respect to specifically his christian historiography historiography and you know um and extrapolating from that then you know um a an account of you know the, a, a particular distinction that he holds to between law as gazettes and law as recht so a law that's a it, it is a particularity of law um which um um uh, which has no claims to universalization per se it, it therefore you know for benjamin at least opens a door to a uh, sense that you can be an unwit unwitting, and you can unwittingly follow file of the law, as opposed to the other kind, which is the kind that then obviously Benjamin also cites in the essay, and uh, he in these fragments associates with the uh, um, claim to universalizability um, of of running a file and therefore encompasses all of life, the opposite of which can simply be no one, right? Um, you know, that is another form of law, which I think is the kind that, it, you know, that, that, um, that, that um, still um, inhabits a certain understanding of where uh, the time of experience uh, will only ever sort of in, like lead to its an, an, an interruption of itself uh, via perhaps a return of some sort of uh, um, a, a return that is unexpected, perhaps, but only insofar as there's a, you know, it, it's conceived as uh, um, pertaining to a certain kind of duration that meets up against the limit to, to, of understanding. And this idea that like the whole time is not graspable, unless it's within this paradoxical notion of having to be within and also outside the very limitations of one's understanding of that whole time itself. That's what I was trying to get at as a construction of a certain kind of a, what Christian historiography as in, in Benjamin's own fragments, and then extrapolate that um, to, um, to sort of say, uh, we sort of apply pressure on the, I, on, the, on the notion that there's some other sort of way, way in which that paradox can be conceived. Um, yeah. uh, you know, we, we arrive at perhaps an opening within Benjamin's own thinking towards something like, um, um, uh, holding, you know, making a, making a making law accountable to uh, other forms of time, uh, um, other other forms, specifically the in, indigenous time, specifically that which has been subsumed under colonization. And this is then I veered off into philology, obviously at that point. Right? Benjamin actually cared about things like this you know, in a certain way, um, but that's sort of what I was. Um, 
trying to get at that, yeah, there is a, um, a issue. I think what, what you uncovered in your book, you know, that there's an, there is, there is an issue, a very interesting problem of who inhabits or what inhabits that lapse that you were talking about, right? And that lapse is not simply, it cannot simply hew once again to this uh, chronolo chronology within which interruption itself is, is supposedly a, um, uh, think about only within that, only without that sense of that chronology, but there's some Thank other chronology where interruption can be rethought. Thanks, Julia. I wonder if any of the other panelists would like to address this. We now have another group of little questions, vaguely relatable to this one, but I'd rather hear from you uh, if you have something on this topic uh, of, of this question before I ask some of those other ones. So um, one of the questions asks, uh, asks about the reception of Benjamin in Latin America uh, and asks Pablo to reflect upon that. Uh, independently asks also concerning laughter. I would like to root, I mean, if you want to think about the reception of Benjamin in Latin America through the question of the explosion of laughter, that would be cool. But they, these are separate parts of the question and separate questions so that you don't have to, you wouldn't have to. Uh, another question concerns how we might think about justice, relation to me messianicity and to come within the context of contemporary uprisings. Right? So there, I suppose that the issue of temporality um, a, a messianic horizon versus the horizon of the urgent now of the uprising might be might be in play. Um, so I would let me throw those that cluster of questions out and see who who wants to repescar. Paul, I think that you do. You have this face that says yes. I want to answer. Well, I don't think I can. I think they're for Pablo. I can just say that in my interactions with the Chilean world, the reception of Benjamin there is, it's unique. It speaks in a lot of ways that M was fishing out of the, Pablo's beautiful book to traces in Benjamin that really haven't come out before. Um, and it, it's really worth engaging with. But Pablo, maybe you want to talk about how you see the reception of Benjamin in Chile and Latin America? Yeah, of course. Um, well, in the first place, I would say something about the, the, the whole time, of, about the whole time, and the and, uh, question about universalization on the one hand and uh, totalization on the other hand. And I mean, you have something that has to do with the universalization of norms and so on but you have to do something that has to do with the totalization of time. So, and, uh, and this, uh, this, the question about the um, moments of divine violence, for instance, and the critical violence, or the question about revolution, the question about interaction to and Benjamin has to do fundamentally with, the, uh, with, the, with a, some sort of interruption of this totalization of time. I, I, there is a beautiful word in Spanish that we have that is ocurrencia. And ocurrencia that, that has to do with humor precisely. Ocurrencia is something that se me ocurre, is something that uh, an idea I have, for instance. Einfall is Deutsch, this is German, the German word for ocurrencia, something that force upon me. Uh, and occurrence is also something that may occur, that happens to me. So we have these two senses, these two meanings uh, packed into this uh, one word. And I would say that this uh, interrupting time, if, if I can call it that way, interruption is a word that is so uh, much used uh, but if, if I can talk about interruption of the totalization of time, I would say that this is the 
time of occurrence, yeah, the time of occurrence, yeah? uh, there is perhaps the same thing, the same time uh, as the time of revolution and the time of humor, and the time of uh, inexhaustible lotter, for instance. Uh, I, I would say that, I would say that. And uh, about uh, the uh, Latin American reception, there is something very peculiar about uh, in our South Cone. The Argentinians as they have also a uh, great work on Benjamin, uh, but many scholars, many intellectuals, I would say more than scholars, intellectuals. And uh, Brazil is another case too. Yeah. Um, and I think it has to do with uh, our political experiences, our political, uh, past the mm, you have to uh, you have to go in search of some tools in order to think of what has happened to us with our military dictatorships uh, very um, um, how do you say that corento they're very I don't know how do you say corento in in English? Violent and violent, but but always with blood. That has, has always to do with blood. Yeah, current is uh, yeah. yeah. It's... Um, and I think that uh, we found Benjamin as a very important tool in order to do this, in order to try to do this, in order to try to think something that, in some in some aspects, was absolutely. Uh, a, inescapable then in the one on the one hand and on the other hand overwhelming uh, it was a challenge to our thinking uh, a challenge that uh, could not uh, give us any possibility of uh, think along uh, along um, normal paths uh, trodden paths i would say Benjamin has this uh, capacity of doing this. He has, he, he had, uh, he, he had some experiences that were also in some way, in some way uh, analogous to us. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a point of our, of this sort of convergence. I have two questions. Um, I do, I don't, we have two questions that are related quite interestingly one is and and these go to m's um intervention i think one's asks how is the interminability of mourning and humor related to resistance and weak power this might also link to the previous question uh about the temporality of messianism versus the quite urgent demands of the revolutionary present so that was one of the questions and the other one uh asked is justice an event whether in a messianic sense or in ben Benjamin's own weak messianic sense, um, or uh, as Professor Tai's reflections on to suggest, a sort of cathartic surrender of tensions that is something less than a life altering phenomenon. So uh, that, that they seem to me to cluster around the question of, of this, uh, this interstitial space of in, in which mourning and humor are related temporarily somehow as modes of interruption. Uh, and the question then becomes how they can be related to resistance, weak power, and the, the, the specific conjunctural uh, moment in which minos namas and resistance occur. Uh, yeah. Uh, but for, for the first thing, uh, I would say that this is just an experiential testimony, I would say. Uh, in the epoch of the dicta dictatorship in Chile, uh, we lived in mourning and in humor. And humor was perhaps one of our mm, fundamental, I would say, uh, weapons of resistance, of surviving in, in the dictature. So, in, and, and humor, uh, let us dis discover some things, some uh, some things in our thinking too, that could uh, that uh, 
um, the, the could do us, voy a decirlo en castellano, que nos permitió de alguna manera hacer dos cargos de lo que estaba pasando, sin dejar nunca de uh, uh, abandonar, por así decir, a su suerte, a nuestros muertos, a nuestros desaparecidos. O sea, el muerto tuvo un, un papel absolutamente fundamental. Y creo que ese, esa relación entre morning y humor es una relación que, que tiene que ver de alguna manera con lo que estábamos conversando, que tiene que ver con cómo tú eh, sobrevives eh, un tiempo que en rigor es prácticamente todo el tiempo. Sí, y ese, esa, ese todo el tiempo al que me refería con lo de la totalización también. O sea, es, siempre estamos en ese todo el tiempo. Entonces, siempre estamos también uh, eh, con, bueno, con lo que precariamente podamos hacer, siempre estamos también abriendo el espacio, o sea, abriendo una inminencia, la inminencia de algo otro. ¿no? Y, y pienso que la justicia es un poco eso, es, es nada más que esa inminencia. Would any of the panelists like to throw something in? Could I read a passage from the book, a short passage? Please, yes. Although you don't mind. It's such a beautiful passage and it brings these things together. Maybe M actually mentioned it in their presentation. By contrast, a weak power is a power that accepts the past insofar as it is past. The simultaneous weakness and power rest on this acceptance. A weak power welcomes what has passed of the past, receives it, and in proportion to this receptivity is weak, and at the same time resists its investment, its capitalization in the present, and to this extent is power. So the resistance and the, the weak power and receiving of a past that is not present now, that is to say not the domi dominating or dominant um, facts of the past that are still alive, but to receive another past is a kind of resistance, I think Pablo was saying. You could say this is a kind of resistance that's possible under dictatorship. That isn't a direct power against power resistance. Pablo, I don't know if you would agree, but there's, a res there's an opening that happens in this. It's not to be wished for that one does this thinking under a dictatorship. But given that's the situation, the past opens up in a different dimension to you. And you can bring a past that has not been cited to bear on the present as a form of resistance. I take this to be a very strong reading of Benjamin, a really hopeful one, one that I can use. I feel like we, I have this view of Chile that it lived through what we're living through in this country 40 years in advance and is sort of the cutting edge of thinking of, of these things, of Trump, of neoliberalism. And so this is, this is really great news to our ears and things we can use right now. Thank you, Paul. Pablo? If, if I might be permitted to ask a question also, just on this, this issue here, um, I wonder if being open to receiving the past as past like this is a matter that is subject to the will, to, to what we want, to an intentional and formulable desire. Uh, it seems to me that that installs a function for the will, a function of sorting and and, and, pro and protecting and, and hierarchizing that m may not be entirely, uh, may not entirely be the case. I, and I wonder if, if that's something that, that is if, if a disposition towards the past is generally passed like this um, is, is possible unless we abandon quite a substantial conception of responsibility and of willed responsibility and of int intended responsibility uh, with it as well, which perhaps goes to Paul North's question uh, of what happens to, to justice um, under, the, under the aspect of Pablo Yafsun's analysis of it. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, um, a ver, lo único que puedo pensar de eso, lo único que puedo en este momento pensar de eso tiene que ver con uh, un tipo de responsabilidad que consiste en la receptividad, ¿sí? que no se propone, por así decir, ¿eh? a ser responsable por algo en el sentido de que eso le pudiese dar sentido, en la medida en que eso le pudiese dar sentido a ese algo. Eso es como anticiparse justamente al modo de, de presencia o, o también de, el modo de, de desaparición de ese algo. Si uno lo que hace es tomar, uh, ser el portavoz del algo. ¿no? Creo que esa vocería es la que impide escuchar la voz de las bocas quebradas. ¿no? O sea, esa vocería o sea, es una prosopopeya, o sea, es hablar, o dejar que, o sea, es un poco algo, no es eso lo que decía Neruda, ¿no? pero dejar que hablen por, por mi boca, dejar que los muertos hablen por mi boca, esa gran prosopopeya, es, eh, tiene que ver, creo yo, con esa voluntad de responsabilidad, que es justamente lo que de una u otra manera me parece que Benjamin invita a abandonar y abrirse a esta otra receptividad que tiene la responsabilidad de dejar que aquello otro mm, insista, así, insista a su manera, en uno, en nosotros, y nosotras, y nosotros, en todos, en todos. We have a, a question that, again, there's a subterranean connection. Um, I would greatly appreciate if Pablo could elaborate on the temporality of a returned past that he addressed toward the end of the talk. In particular, how he presents this as a situated temporality. The question specifically, Pablo, do you see this situated temporality as a condition that might be shared, a regional temporality? defined by transition in Latin America, of which Chile seems the iconic, tragic harbinger. Uh, mm. ¿Puedes precisarme un poco más el, el, el punto? Eh, Perdón, me perdí leyendo algo que estaba aquí en el chat. Así. Ya, ya, ya. Um, The question is how re the return of the past or this uh, disposition toward a past qua past might be regionalized and might be inflected by the specific situation of Latin America mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the, uh, of which Chile is a kind of tragic exemplar in this case. Yeah. Um, no sé, realmente no, no sé. Eh, um, creo que eso es algo que seguimos procesando, que no terminamos de procesar, me parece. Y que uh, solo, solo diría yo, no sé, de mi, de mi experiencia, solo intentando escribir algo, solo intentando traducir algo, encuentras algunas pistas que te permiten reubicarte en ese, en ese lugar, que no es nunca un lugar de retorno, tam tampoco es un lugar de retorno, el pasado en cuanto pasado, sino que es un, es, es un, un, es un interregno, por así decirlo, un interregno temporal en que... Y la escritura ayuda a eso, creo, la escritura tiene mucho que ver con poder situarse en ese interregno temporal, uh, y para mí es la única manera de poder arreglarme con eso, no tengo, no tengo otra forma. La otra pregunta, por cierto, es cómo tú haces esto, cómo haces de esto una política. Y creo que eso sigue siendo una pregunta decisiva para nosotros, decisiva para América Latina. O sea, creo que eso es uno de los grandes problemas. O sea, estamos también de alguna manera como ah, eh, minados o cavados por esta experiencia. Y eso mismo también produce una suerte de inhibición política que permite que cosas como la transición en Chile hayan tenido lugar. ¿no? Que no se haya podido llegar a una eh, mejor solución respecto de, por ejemplo, eh, las leyes que llegó la dictadura. Si hablamos del tema constitucional, por ejemplo. 
uh, a follow-up question about re returning time. Um, some of the, the questions that we that we're seeing here concern this the way in which this might be specified as a Latin American phenomenon. There's a phenomenon, maybe not Latin American, but perhaps of, of transitions, of the transition mm -hmm. from political model to other, other economic models, for example. Um, and, and they ask about the, the translation, to use that word, of the problematic from the general conceptual realm into the particulars of the situation and back. That, so I think that maybe focusing on that for just a second, how is the transition, how is the specificity of transitional moments in Latin America a way of allowing us to think about the specific uh, absorption of Benjamin into Latin America, but also a possible translation of Benjamin out into the international sphere via the Latin American reception. Mm. A ver, yo, hay, un, hay un punto respecto de los, las posibilidades de traducción, translation possibilities, uh, between uh, different, between experiences, historical and political experiences that, have been, that are very different, but that has some, some points of contact, I would say, voy a decirlo en castellano. Uh, nosotros tuvimos una experiencia muy interesante trabajando en un proyecto en conjunto, creo que estaba Pemesh Lab uh, antes en, en la, la audiencia, y fue justamente con él y con otras personas de Sudáfrica que trabajamos en el proyecto, también con Oxford y con Iván. Y lo que me, me sorprendió, lo que nos sorprendió, es que conversando con eh, eh, la gente de Sudáfrica, eh, vimos que había muchas cosas que no, no era necesario hablarlas, a pesar de la absoluta diferencia de las eh, procedencias, por así decir, nuestras, de, de, los, de las experiencias habidas y todo eso. Sin embargo, había una suerte de curiosa, no sé cómo llamarla, alegoría, analogía no es una buena palabra, alegoría tampoco lo es, pero había una posibilidad de traducción, había una, como tú sabes, la traducción es performativa, entonces había una traducción en performance, justamente, entre, en, en nuestras conversaciones, y eso me parece un punto importante que también tiene que ver con la necesidad de que el modo como Benjamin ha sido procesado en América Latina, el modo como muchas otras cosas han sido procesadas en América Latina en todo este tiempo, eh, necesariamente tiene que ponerse en conversación, por así decir, con otros lugares del sur. O sea, creo que esa es una tarea fundamental, o sea, la, la noción de Global South, que no viene del sur, sino que viene del norte, es sin embargo la apertura de un espacio que creo vital para nosotros, que, que establecer ese tipo de <coughs> conversaciones que nos permiten justamente producir esos efectos de traducción, que creo que a su vez también tienen <coughs> una especial importancia política. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, I wonder if it would be possible to, to pry a little bit more into this question. It seems to me, to, to, and to ask the question, is this specific to Benjamin? Um, that is, what about Benjamin's oeuvre corpus, the construction of that figure, makes his work the locus of this kind of performative translation uh, for the global south now? Uh, is there something specific to Benjamin that doesn't obtain, for example, with, with uh, other writers, with Arendt, with, um, let's say, with Freud, that, that, that is specific to Benjamin now? It seems to me that, that that's part of what the, our colleagues are asking, too. Um, yo, bueno, yo soy, yo tengo muchos, muchos nombres en, en mi panteón, por decirlo así. Así que Benjamin es uno de esos nombres y, y, y no sabría decir eh, cuál es el grado de esa especificidad, porque hay muchos otros que también son 
necesarios y, y en sus especificidades también imprescindibles para poder uh, pensar. Y además yo soy particularmente diletante, así que me intereso por muchas cosas diversas. Pero creo que en esa diversidad también uno puede, de alguna manera, al mismo tiempo que desorientarse, orientarse un poco, perdiéndose uno tal vez se orienta mejor que teniendo una cartilla, una pauta, un mapa. Entonces, me parece sí que hay una cuestión que tiene que ver, en términos pendominales, con algo que eh, conversábamos hace un rato, eh, y que tal, tal vez en parte también el hecho de que no exista algo así como una obra benjaminiana. ¿eh? Existe un corpus, pero no una obra benjaminiana. Y crees, creo que ese, esa suerte de... de uh, lugar asintótico, es decir, hacia el que apuntan los múltiples componentes de ese corpus, es algo que particularmente favoreció la recepción de Peña en, en, entre nosotros. Eh, en la medida en que entre nosotros tampoco existe algo así como una obra a la que podamos apelar, por así decir, que existan fundamentalmente grandes escrituras literarias entre nosotros pero nada en términos propiamente de filosofía, de pensamiento teórico, a lo que pudiésemos apelar con la magnitud que otras latitudes o regiones pueden apelar. Entonces, esta misma suerte de ausencia de centro, si, si se puede decir así, esta diversidad, esta diseminación de la obra mendiaminiana, creo que fue uno de los elementos específicos que produjo esta suerte de, de, de ¿cómo se podría decir?, de, de asociación entre nuestras regiones intelectuales latinoamericanas y su trabajo. Estás mute. Sorry. Um, uh, I think we should probably be wrapping up the conversation, and I wonder if any of the panelists have a response to answer to intervention to any in, in response to echoing any of the questions that we've heard from uh, from the, the two mondes of all the world outside of, of our little screen uh, that they would like to, to bring in. Algo pendiente, anything that was pending that, that you wanted to to Chuck, with Julia, <laughs> or, or M. I feel like I've spoken too much, but I mean, just, just because you brought up pending. <laughs> I, do, oh. I mean, I, I did, I mean, I just wanted to throw in the I, idea that, I mean, for me, you know, looking specifically at what constitutes the whole time, limbo, including the limbo, right? So including the possibility of return without that return necessarily you know, reinscribing itself into that dialectic that then becomes what Derrida calls undecidability means for someone like Benjamin, right, grasping a whole hold of a whole time without the paradoxical tensions that are associated with it. If we, you know, so long as we regard that interruption as falling outside of the limits of our understanding, right? So it's a new you know, grasping a new, you know, new, new, you know, grasping a new, this like temp, like wholeness of temporality without sort of once again reinscribing oneself in that dialectic with interruption, duration, duration, um, means then, you know, specifically, you know, thinking of without, you know, thinking the paradox without re, you know, re reiterating the paradox, but then also um, being able to then distinguish between Gesetz and Recht. Right, the partic like particularity and total like and, and the totalization, to, to, totalizability of certain kinds of law. Like they can like distinguish between like what they um what um um the two, and I think that may be part of what he what interested him so much also in uh, thinking about the uh, particular kind of interruption, so to speak, that indigeneity represents. Um, and if I can, in that, but. thank you. And if I could ask you a question about something that I found quite shocking about your, uh, your intervention, which is the relation between the interminability of laughter and the interminability of mourning. 
uh, these are they how do they work together um, in relation perhaps to the notion of interruption that Julia was just mentioned um, I wish I could answer you this was a question to Pablo <laughs> <laughs> um, but I find that um, you know, laughter is a kind of wonderful thing. And just as what is lost can come upon us and resurge, um, even though it's been forgotten. So too, what is anything from the past can arrive as material that can burst in into the field of hilarity. <laughs> and I think um, that persistence of the past is um, the vital nerve of both mourning and humor. And like Pablo suggested, I, I, I just think it, uh, Morning is unsurvivable without laughter. Short answer, I have nothing more than that really. <laughs> All right, uh, Pablo, do you wanna give us the last word or shall, shall I assume it as a kind of sovereign gesture? No, yo simplemente tengo que repetir la, el agradecimiento y, y la felicidad de haber estado con ustedes aquí. Y nuevamente insistir en que quede muy uh, impresionado por las intervenciones y que tengo que pensar lo que, lo que pude anotar, lo que pude recoger de ellas. Así que gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you to you. Thank you to my, our panelists. Thank you for making time in very far flung places. Um, thank you very much for ICCDP, for, for Polity. Thank you above all to Pablo for having produced this extraordinarily productive and interesting work, which uh, has brought us together and which will, I think, continue like the past and like humor to, to nourish us and interrupt us and form us in the future. And thank you again to Natalia and to the staff of, uh, of the ICCTP. Um, Y hasta muy pronto. I hope we hope to see you at the next one of these and come back, visit often, and by all means, buy the book. <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs>